Awesome song. That was an awesome song. Are we on? Check. Are we not on? There we go. Okay, I'll say it again. That was an awesome song. It's amazing how the Lord coordinates things that that song fit in with my topic right from the book of Revelation. Well, good evening, everybody. I can see my wife out there. Oh, it is good to be here at SoCal, SoCal Camp Meeting. This was actually my uh, very first camp meeting I ever came to was this camp meeting years ago. My wife and I met in the ABC many years ago, so a lot, a lot of things happen at camp meeting. And many of you know that my son, our son, was born uh, right around the time that I had to walk off this platform in the middle of my sermon, which I'll tell you about that a little bit more when we're done. But God is good, and I'm just so thrilled to be here among friends at the Central California Conference Camp Meeting. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Chapter 13, and let me see if we can get my keynote image on the screen. I hope we can. There we go. And there is my title. And actually, let me just do a quick little build there. There we go. Get ready for the mark of the beast. That is our topic for this evening. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be here with your people here at this camp meeting. Thank you so much for keeping me alive, keeping my wife alive, giving us two beautiful children and giving us a chance to be here. And we pray as we open the Bible, as we open the book of Revelation, that the Holy Spirit will please talk to our hearts about what is happening right now in the world around us and how the, all indicators are that Jesus is coming soon. Please bless us and prepare us for what is coming upon this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, are you ready for this? You ready? All right. It was in the year 1995 that I was holding a Bible prophecy seminar uh, in the Vancouver, Washington area. And I still remember driving back and forth to the meetings and looking off into the distance and seeing this mountain, this very imposing looking mountain, Mount St. Helens. It's actually a volcano. In the year 1980, that volcanic mountain became very active and it began to spurt, it began to sputter, it began to smoke and people were warned all over the area that if you live anywhere near this mountain, you've got to get out because this mountain is set to blow. And most people listened to the warning, but there was one particular man whose name was Harry Truman, not uh, the former president, Harry Truman, obviously. And he had been living at the base of the mountain for a long time, and he thought to himself, I'm not going to move. I'm staying right where I am. I don't think the mountain's going to go off anyway. Well, it did. It finally did go off, and they never found Brother Truman's body. Uh, speculation is it's somewhere at the bottom of, of a lake at the base of the mountain called Spirit Lake. And that was it for Brother Truman because he refused to take warning. What we are about to study, I like to call Mount Revelation 13 because my conviction is that this mountain is spurting. This mountain is sputtering. This mountain is smoking big time all around us, and it won't be long until the final prophecies of this mountain explode. And God wants us to be ready, to be ready for the coming of Jesus. The bad news is there's a time of trouble ahead of us. But the good news is that Jesus is going to bring his people through that time, and that he is coming, and I believe his coming is very soon to get us out of here. I'd like to raise my kids in heaven uh, our son is almost 11, and my hope and prayer is that uh, Jesus will come before he's a teenager. That's what I hope. 
but God will bring us through anyway. Anyway, all right, let's, uh, let's go into Revelation chapter 13 and let's have a Bible study. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and what did he see? He saw a beast rising up out of the sea. And there are many characteristics of this beast. I'll just go through this quickly because I've got so much to do. But when you read verse 5, the Bible says that this beast has a mouth speaking great things. When you look at verse 7, it tells us that this beast made war against the people of God, against the saints. 13.7 also says that authority would be given to this beast over every tribe, tongue, and nations. Nation. And in verse 3, it tells us that all the world would eventually wonder and be amazed at this beast. Now, I'm going to say some things this evening that are probably going to shock uh, at least some of you. I don't know whether there may be some of you here that are not, are not Seventh-day Adventists. This is obviously a Seventh-day Adventist campground. There are many watching on television, and it's no doubt probably a mixed audience out there. But I am going to share with you a Seventh-day Adventist perspective on Bible prophecy how we understand the book of Revelation, and I'm going to do it right from the Bible, and then we're going to look around and we're going to see things that are going to be very, very clear. Uh, My conviction is that we we need to speak in love. We need to be as diplomatic as possible, as uh, somebody here just recently said a couple nights ago, but we need to tell the truth. Isn't that right? The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help us God. It is a fact of history, if you study history, here's a picture of numerous Protestant reformers, uh, John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church, Martin Luther, who founded the Lutheran Church, John Calvin, who founded the Presbyterian Church. And if you look at history, it is a a fact of history that Protestants and major denominations like Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, for 400 years from the time of the 1500s at least down into well into the 1800s when they studied Revelation 13 and studied Bible prophecy they interpreted the first beast of Revelation 13 to be a symbol of the Roman church and I want to say Roman church system because I believe and I think most of us believe that there are a whole lot of uh, wonderful people within the Roman Catholic Church, and there's a whole lot of them that are going to heaven. You believe that? I believe that. I believe that too. So this is not dealing with individuals, but this is dealing with a system that when you really study the prophecy, the prophecy fits the system, and the system has strayed away from the Bible, and it has been doing this for a long, long time. Now, that's the first beast in Revelation chapter 13. There's another beast that surfaces in verse 11. Revelation 13, 11. And there's the verse on the screen as well. John says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke how? He spoke like a dragon. Right, now, if we had a lot of time, we would take a look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 describes four beasts, and in verse 23, it specifically tells us what a beast represents in prophecy. We don't have to guess. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to be like magicians pulling uh, interpretations out of hats. But Daniel chapter 7 verse 23 says that the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom upon the earth, that beasts represent great nations in prophecy. The first beast is a religio-political nation, and the second beast rising up out of the earth, and I'll just go through this quickly, and I have actually written a number of books on this, and if you'd like to get some of these, they're in the bookstore. I don't have time to go into all the details right now, but we have a little book on the first beast, uh, The Antichrist Identified, another little book called The United States in Bible Prophecy, a pocket book that's over in the bookstore. The second beast comes out of the earth, or a wilderness area. It has two horns representing a separation or a division of power. Those horns have no crowns on them like the first beast. His horns showing that the second beast is not ruled by kings, but its leaders are elected through democratic processes. 
It is also a lamb-like beast. There the Bible says he's like a lamb. It's not a lamb. The lamb in the Bible represents Jesus, but this beast is lamb-like, showing that it has mild Christian features. But those features will, will change and break down. And eventually, Scripture says that this power will speak as a dragon. And when you put the pieces together, uh, Seventh-day Adventists believe that the first beast represents the Roman church and the second beast represents the United States. Now, if you go down to the next verse, down to verse 12, we will find that both beasts start cooperating together as we near the end of time. Verse 12 says that he, referring to the second beast, the lamb-like beast, the earth beast, that he would exercise all of the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he would cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So verse 12 tells us that the second beast, representing the most powerful political nation on earth tonight, is going to be cooperating with the first beast which represents the most powerful religio-political organization on the earth tonight. And it's the Bible says that the second beast is going to be promoting and causing people who live on the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now then when you go down to verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 16, verse 16 says that eventually... The second beast will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he who had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, as I've looked at this prophecy and studied it very carefully, notice that word all. It says that the second beast will eventually cause all to receive the mark of the beast. Now, if the second beast is going to do that, that second beast must at some point become a superpower on planet Earth. Isn't that right? He must have a lot, a lot of political influence. Now, what is this mark, this mark of the first, the first beast? Hold on to your seats if you have never heard what I'm about to tell you if you've never heard it before. Uh, it, is, it is no secret. It's obvious that Seventh-day Adventists, which I'm assuming most of us are, that we go to church on Saturday, not Sunday, right? That's why we're called Seventh-day Adventists. That's right. Now, it's also no secret that most Christians today go to church on Sunday, which the New Testament and the dictionary also, and encyclopedias tell us, is the first day of the week. So there's the seventh day followed by the first day of the week. Now, why is it that today most Christians in the world, as sincere as they may be, why is it that the vast majority of Christians around the world keep the first day of the week instead of the seventh day, which is the day that God pinpointed in the Ten Commandments? Well, I have a a convert's catechism of Catholic doctrine here, which is a catechism of the Roman Church. I've used this many, many times in many seminars. And on page 50 of this particular catechism published in 1946 by Reverend Peter Geierman with the Vatican imprimatur on the first page. It says, question, what day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So the Roman Church comes right out and they say that they changed the day. Now, not only that, but if you study history and if you look at certain official statements from the Roman Church, and I've got one of them right here. This is a very famous, well-documented statement in a letter, November 11, 1895. It was uh, communicated from Cardinal Gibbons, who used to be one of the most well-known Catholic cardinals in America in the late 1800s. It was communicated in an official letter through his chancellor, C.F. Thomas. And this is what he said. He said, of course, 
the Catholic Church claims that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And this act is a what? It is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Now, let me show you something that I brought here all the way with me from North Idaho. I've carried these around many times. My wife finally convinced me to start putting them in suitcases and shipping them instead of carrying them in backpacks uh, from seminar to seminar. When I carried them in my backpack, it was, it's, uh, it's quite amusing to look at those who monitor the monitors as I'm going through security. And I, I watch their faces as these tables go through. And I've seen eyes just get really big. I've seen people look at me and say, is that what I think it is? They can actually read the, the Ten Commandments right there. And uh, one time they actually wanted to take them out and scan them to make sure there were no explosives on them. And I said, I said, this is the most moral backpack you'll ever find. This, I'm holding two tables of stone, written, the Bible says in Exodus 31, verse 18, with the finger of God. The Ten Commandments are different than any other law that has ever been written in the history of this world. What makes this law different is that this law was written with God's own finger. And when you look at commandment number four, it's very clear that God wrote with his finger, remember, don't forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. To me, this is very impressive, very impressive. And basically, the Roman church says we change the Sabbath into the first day of the week. And the very fact that we were able to do that is a mark of our authority as the true church. Now, I do not accept that authority. I believe that God's law is bigger than the words and the actions of any man. Any man. God's law is God's law. And the seventh day is right there as the commandment of the Lord. And it is the only commandment that God says, remember, don't forget. Now, I'm going to show you some very interesting things. If you go down in your Bibles, and if you look again at verse 16, verse 16 tells us that one of these days, this mark, which we interpret to be a, a mark of Rome's authority, will be enforced, he causes all will be enforced upon the people of this earth. In other words, if, if Seventh-day Adventists are correct in our interpretation, a prophecy, and what I'm telling you right now is mainstream Adventist belief. It's not uh, an aberrant view. This is what we believe as a people, as a people. And if this is true, then we can expect that at some point there is going to be a Sunday law. There are going to be, there's going to be a national Sunday law. There are going to be Sunday laws enforced around the world. Now, is something like that even remotely possible in this generation? Well, let's talk about that. Let me give you some very, very interesting pieces of information. Here's a picture of Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis talking about the time when Benedict decided to resign. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but popes typically do not resign. They are in office for life. But Benedict decided it was time to step down because he had a very interesting, unusual experience. This particular Catholic article that came out in 2013 is titled, Ex-Pope Benedict Says God Told Him to Resign During Mystical Experience. Uh, Benedict describes some inner experience where he believes God told him it was time to step down, time to pave the way for someone else. Now, the very day that he announced his resignation, which shocked the Catholic world when Benedict came out and said, I'm going to resign and did this publicly. Believe it or not, lightning struck the Vatican twice that very night. And this is not a Photoshop uh, altered picture. 
This is the real deal. It says the same day that Pope Benedict XVI announced his resignations stunning the world, that picture went viral. Now, as I've thought about that and as I continue to tell you more pieces of information, uh, I'm not a prophet, but it sure seems to me that it's quite possible that this was a sign from above indicating that God had pushed a button in his prophetic scenario that basically said, initiate final sequence. And things began to fall into place rapidly after this happened. The very night that Pope Francis accepted the, uh, the decision to become the next pope, he says here, this is another Catholic publication, article March 7, 2015, he said, on the night of my election, I also had an experience of the, of the closeness of God that gave me a great sense of interior freedom and peace. The cardinal quoted the pope as saying, and that sense has never left, left me. He had some kind of a mystical experience himself the night that he was elected pope, and in fact, that experience was so, so uh, dramatic that his sister was interviewed, and she said, I don't recognize this guy. She doesn't even recognize the personality of her own brother. Now, here are, here are two pictures. Here's a before and an after picture. That's what he used to look like as a cardinal, and this is what he looks like as pope. Quite, uh, quite significant. Now, not only that, but here's a few pieces of information. Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope that's ever been pope. Not only that, but he is now the most popular person on planet Earth. Who gathers the biggest crowds today? It's not Barack Obama. It's not Oprah Winfrey. It's not Mick Jagger. It's not any rock star. It is Pope Francis. He has the most influential Twitter account on the planet. He is extremely popular. He has been invited by the Speaker of the House, which you probably know, to address a joint session of our Congress on September 24. So Francis is coming to America in a very short time, in the next couple of months. And not only that, but the very next day he's going to address the United Nations and the word on the street is that the gathering in New York of the United Nations that Francis will be speaking at is probably going to be the largest gathering of world leaders ever in the history of the planet. Now, all of these things are quite significant. Now, let me tell you why they are significant. This article came out about a year ago. July 6, 2014, Associated Press, where the title of the article is called Keeping Stores Open on Sunday is Not Beneficial for Society, says Pope Francis. And the uh, paragraph there says, Pope Francis says, opening businesses on Sundays is not beneficial for society because the priority should be not economic but human, and that the stress should be on families, friendships, not commercial relationships. It's no secret that Pope Francis is a strong promoter of Sunday observance. Just a few weeks ago, on June 18, 2015, and here's an article in the New York Times, and a lot of us were very anxious to see what this encyclical said, but a 184 or 83 page encyclical was released by the Pope, translated into languages around the world, covered by major media, and the title here of this article says, Pope Francis in sweeping encyclical calls for swift action on climate change. And there's the article says, Vatican, Pope Francis on Thursday called for a radical transformation of politics, economics, and individual lifestyles to confront environmental degradation and climate change, blending a biting critique of consumerism and irresponsible development with a plea for swift and unified global action. So this encyclical is dealing with the topic of climate change. Basically, it's saying that the disasters, the tornadoes, the earthquakes, uh, the bizarre weather patterns, the things that we're seeing on this planet are because of something called global warming, which has to do with increased emissions, carbon emissions coming from the planet because of exploitation of the Earth. 
and he's offering recommendations in his encyclical. The same day that the encyclical hit the news, the U.S. Department of State issued a press statement. Same day, here it says, Pope Francis encyclical on the environment, and it talks about his powerful encyclical calling for a common response to the critical threat of climate change poses to our common home. His plea for all religions to work together reflects the urgency of the challenge. And the paragraph at the bottom says, it, talk, it speaks of the devastating impacts of climate change like heat waves, damaging floods, coastal sea levels rising, historic droughts. These are already taking place, threatening the habitat of all humans and other creatures that we depend upon to survive. We have a responsibility to meet this challenge and prevent the worst impacts. So basically, his encyclical, uh, and it's, it's quite a read. You can find it on the internet, you can read it. There's a picture of it. The encyclical goes into all kinds of different suggestions on how people can come together all around the world and how we can initiate certain kinds of uh, initiatives to move in the direction of healing the planet, taking better care of the earth, affecting climate change, making things better so life down here on earth will go smoother. Now, we looked at this encyclical when it finally came out and we were quite keen to, f to find out exactly what was in there. Now, look at this. This is on this is in section 237 of the Pope's encyclical. Right in the middle of it, maybe not exactly the word count, but it's right in there, is a very strong appeal from Pope Francis to the people of the world. And this encyclical was not just addressed to Catholics, but to every person on planet Earth to keep Sunday as part of the global solution to heal the planet. And there's the quote right there, right from the encyclical. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day, of, a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. That's what the Pope said. And he's basically saying this is part of, the, of what we need to do to help climate change so that the calamities that are happening increasingly on planet Earth will hopefully start decreasing. It's climate change connected to calamities connected to Sunday. Now, here is a statement from a little lady who lived in the 1800s, a little lady named Ellen G. White, who Seventh-day Adventists still respect, at least a lot of us do, hopefully all of us do, that we respect her writings, we believe that God gave this little lady a gift, and the gift was to point to the Bible and to help us to understand the Word of God, to lift up Jesus, and she also had a lot to say about Revelation 13 and about Bible prophecy. And in her most monumental work, called the book, the book is called The Great Controversy, she wrote this, and this particular edition was published in 1911, over 100 years ago. She said on page 605, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath and that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. So she looked down the stream of time to a time of calamities and Sunday rising up in the mix as part of the solution, the apparent solution, the human perspective on a solution that would help solve the problems of this world. Now, this is very, very interesting, what I'm about to show you. The very day that the Pope's encyclical, speaking to people all around the world from the most popular man on the planet, came out, the very same day, another press release was issued from the White House, from the office of President Obama. And it's a statement by the president on Pope Francis' encyclical. And look at what it says. Quote, he said, I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis' encyclical and deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral what? Authority of his position for action on global climate change. Now, look at your Bible and look at Revelation 13, verse 7. Revelation 13, 7. Look at your Bible, look at the news, look at your Bible. Revelation 13, verse 7 says that authority in the New King James Bible, some Bibles say power, my Bible says authority would be given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. 
Here is President Obama referring to Pope Francis and saying, with the full moral authority of his position, I support his encyclical on climate change. Now, not only that, but when you read on, the statement says, he says, Obama says, I believe the United States must be a what? Must be a leader in the effort of implementing the Pope's suggestions dealing with the environment and dealing with climate change. Now, brothers and sisters, that is Revelation 13 being played out right in front of our eyes. Revelation 13, verse 12, says the second beast is going to promote the first beast and he's going to lead out in, ultimately, the enforcement of the mark of the first beast. And Sunday is in the encyclical that President Obama says America must lead out and help implement the Pope's suggestions. Are you following me? Yeah, wow, I heard somebody say, wow. That's right, wow. Now, let me give you quite a few more wows. There's a lot of wows in all of this. Uh, Ellen White also wrote in the book Last Day Events, or this is a compilation, page 135, that foreign nations will follow the example of the United States, though she leads out. Yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. So she said, America is going to lead out. And President Obama said, I believe the United States must be a leader in this effort. Bingo. Prophecy and the words of the little lady who was inspired by God to point us to the prophecy and to help us to understand what is happening in the world. Here's an article from Fox News, and I could multiply these kind of articles. They're coming rapidly these days. Fox News, the title was called, Let's Make Sunday a Day of Rest for God's Sake. Here's another article that came out from The Guardian, and the title is called Slow Sunday, The Simple Solution to Global Warming. In other words, if we want to help counteract global warming, if we want to help counteract climate change, if we want to initiate different activities on Earth to help improve the life of the planet, we should slow down and start keeping Sunday better. Because if we'll do that, if we don't go to work on Sunday, there'll be a lot less carbon emissions going up from automobiles, a lot less industry, a lot less business is going to be uh, churning out different products. And this will affect the environment, it'll affect climate change, it'll help the planet, and it will lessen the calamities that are increasing around us. That is the argument that is now being presented. Here is a statement, and this was very, uh, this was shocking to a lot of people. This is a CNN article. Senator, church attendance should be mandatory. This came out Friday, March 27, 2015. Now, there you see a picture of that lady there. There's a closer picture. Uh, she, her name is Sylvia Allen. She is a Republican, an Arizona state senator. And this was reported on CNN. March 27, 2015, CNN affiliate KTVK reported that during a gun bill debate, Arizona State Senator Sylvia Allen asked, how we get back to a moral rebirth in this country, I don't know, since we are slowly eroding religion at every opportunity that we have. And we can certainly see that, can't we? Religion is eroding. You know, the Supreme Court, we know this, uh, June 26, made a ruling that dealt with marriage. Isn't that right? Marriage was made by God on what day? On the sixth day of creation week. And the next day was the Sabbath. The Supreme Court just issued a ruling that affects marriage as God made it in the Bible. And I believe this is a dry run. This is a dry run. Sixth day Marriage, next day, is the seventh day, and we are going to see the Supreme Court make another decision, and I don't know exactly when it's going to be, but we're not far away. It's going to be affecting the Sabbath. And here, this lady says, we should be debating, she says, 
probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. That's what she said. Now, later on, she sort of backtracked on that because the heat was on, and she was interviewed and asked a lot of questions about this, but whatever she said afterwards, the reality is she said this. She said this, and the date on that is March 27, 2015. She said it, and uh, others are saying it. These kind of statements don't just come out of, a, out of nowhere. They're coming from somewhere, and they're lining up with a whole lot of other statements of things that are happening right now. <clears throat> Back to the Pope's encyclical, section 206, he said that, that people of the earth through lifestyle changes can bring healthy pressure to bear on those who wield political, economic, and social power. So basically, it's a, it's a grassroots movement to try to, to motivate the masses to try to influence legislation so that governments will pass legislation dealing with climate change and the recommendations, recommendations that are in the encyclical. In The Great Controversy, page 592, Ellen White wrote, even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Ultimately, Sunday laws are not going to come from the top down, they're going to come from the bottom up. They're going to come from people who are scared as they look at the environment, they're looking at the disasters, they're looking at what's happening on planet Earth, they're listening to the man who has the most moral authority on the planet, which is Pope Francis, they're looking at the encyclical, they're looking at all these different things, and eventually, as things continue to get worse, what's going to happen is pressure will be placed upon legislators. Just like the encyclical said, and as great controversy says, you line them right up together and they fit like a lock and a key. You know what? The little lady was right. She was right. What she wrote fits what's in the encyclical. It's all happening right in front of our eyes. Here's an article that came out April 28, 2015 from the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States, which is a, an alliance of different uh, churches and individuals that are pushing for Sunday legislation. Want to see Sunday lifted up higher and higher, and there's the title of the article, and it says, Sunday as a what? Sunday as a mark of Christian unity. And I can show you many other articles I could put article after article after article that what we have been told, what we have been expecting for a long time, that we are beginning to see the unfolding of these events right in front of our eyes. Are you following me? I tell you, brothers and sisters, it's happening. It's happening right in front of us. And God wants us to understand what's going on. In the book Controversy, page. The Great Controversy, page 605, this is what she said. Heretofore, or in the past, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. People thought, this is crazy. There could never be Sunday legislation in America and around the world. But then she says, but as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. Then the third angel's message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. Now that is an amazing quotation. I, I have been asked in the past years, years ago, people would say to me, uh, Pastor Wahlberg, how close do you think we are to Sunday laws? Do you think that it's going to happen soon or not? And then my response has typically been, when I see Sunday being discussed in the news, when I see it being discussed on Fox News and CNN and ABC and NBC, and when I see these kind of debates coming right out into the open, then I'll know that we're getting very, very close. And I tell you, we are starting to see those debates happening right now. This is not a normal time. This is not business as usual. I, I, Kristen and I were talking 
Uh, we told the kids the other day, Seth is uh, 10, Abby's 7, that based on what's going on in the world right now, we, we really don't think you're ever going to have to go to college. <laughs> of course, you know, we're not prophets. Uh, we don't know for sure, but all indicators are, all indicators are that we are in the final sequence of events. So I came from San Antonio. Yes, whoo-hoo! Yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, for those of us that want to get out of here, I tell you, this is good news. The bad news is there's trouble ahead of us. But the good news is Jesus is going to be with us and he's going to bring us through all the way to the end. Yes, hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. Now, the, now, this says, this says, well, you know, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost had so much power because an event had just taken place. Jesus had just died and been raised from the dead. And Peter preached on that event, and the power of the Spirit was there like had never been known. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for in the final days. The latter reign, the final power of the Holy Spirit is going to be the most powerful when the events that we have been predicting are happening right in front of our eyes. That's when the power, she says, that's when the third angel's message will have an effect which it could not have had before. Praise the Lord. The third message is from Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, let's look at verse 9. Revelation 14, verse 9, the Bible says, Then a third angel followed them, and he said with what kind of a voice? With a loud voice, a clear voice. We have to, yes, we need to be a diplomatic as much as we can. We need to be kind. We need to be respectful. But we need to give the message as it is written in the Bible. Amen. With a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the forehead representing the mind, the hand representing the actions, the same will reap or drink the wine of the wrath of God. And then it describes what will happen to those who get the mark of the beast. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We also have uh, White Horse Media has a couple more books that are in the bookstore, Discovering the Lost Sabbath Truth, another little pocket book about the Sabbath, and Decoding the Mark of the Beast. These are little books that are designed for sharing. They're in the bookstore. They're very, very practical and they help us to understand the third angel's message. And we need to give this message, don't we? We need to, we need to do it. We've got to do it. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? There is a, rocks, okay. <laughs> rocks, that's right. Jesus said the rocks, the rocks will cry out. Now, I want you to notice something. Verse 12 says, here are those who keep the commandments of God. As Sunday legislation gets more and more agitated or the debates, and finally, during a time of global crisis, people listen to Pope Francis's encyclical, to his guidance, to his moral authority, apparent moral authority, and Sunday is enforced by law nationally and around the world, then what are we going to do? What do we do? What do we say? The Bible says we need to lift up the law of God. We need to lift up the commandments of God. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And I've done a lot of thinking about this and studying about this. When you read in the New Testament where Jesus is actually quoting the Old Testament, the heart of the law of God is to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That is the kind of people that God is developing right now. He's preparing a people to love him to love their neighbor as their themselves, whoever they are, whether they're Baptist, Adventist, Catholic, Methodist, Wiccan, Muslim, Republican, Democrat, black, white. May God help us. He, God loves everyone. And we need to love Pope Francis too. We really do. Uh, this coming September when he's in Philadelphia, and I'll give my plug for GLOW, they're looking for volunteers to go to Philadelphia to help pass out tracts. We should be giving out tracts. 
We should hand a tract to the Pope. We should pray for Pope Francis. You know that Jesus loves this man, and I think he would make a, he would do a, he's a man with a mission, and he would make a wonderful Seventh-day Adventist. He really would. He just needs the Holy Spirit to move him over onto the side of the Bible. And, and I want to say, don't write his name out of the book of life, because you don't know what's going to happen during the final hours of Earth's history. There's going to be a whole lot of things that are going to happen, and God is going to be speaking through people who give the third angel's message, who lift up the Ten Commandments, and there's just something very impressive when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which he wrote with his own finger on stone. And I hope that Pope Francis's conscience is open to this kind of conviction. We all need to be open to this kind of conviction. Now, here's something that's very, very important uh, to me, this is the heart of all of this, and that is this, that when you lift up God's law higher and higher and higher in the middle of a world that's falling apart because of sin, and when the Holy Spirit shows us we've broken the fourth, the third, the second, the first, the fifth through the tenth, we haven't loved God with our whole heart, and we haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves, when we're convicted that we're sinners who have broken God's commandments, then, brothers and sisters, who do we need? Who do we need? Who is going to be lifted up higher and higher and higher and higher so that the world will look at him and see that he is the only hope for a world of lost sinners? It's Jesus. God lifts up his law so we can show people their sins and point them to a savior who loves everyone, including the Pope, including me, and you, all of us. God loves us all. We need to have that love, that love in our hearts. We need to get ready for what's coming. Our ministry, White Horse Media, is uh, very, very motivated to be developing resources uh, where we have a little track that we're actually going to be sending to Remnant that will be published, that can be given out all over the nation when Pope Francis is here in September. We have a DVD called Earth's Final Crisis that's in the ABC, one hour, very powerful, that goes through all of these major issues. We have two little newsletters called There Shall Be Signs and The Time Is At Hand. These newsletters are free. We have them at our booth. We have uh, thousands of them there. We'd like to just give them away. You can take them, you can read them, you can learn all about these issues, and then you can give them to your friends. We are producing our ministry in two weeks. Pray for us. We're producing a five-part television series, which is called Getting Ready for the Sunday Law Crisis. And it'll be available as soon as we can get it, get it done, so we can provide simple, practical resources to help people to know what's happening, what the Bible says, to understand the Ten Commandments, and ultimately to realize that Jesus is our only hope. Some time ago, something really, really convicted me. And I realized that the finger that wrote the law on stone, that that finger was on a hand that was nailed to a cross for me. And I believe that grace and the cross and mercy and the love of our Creator hanging on a tree, that that is what's going to break down people's hearts. It's going to melt them. They're going to see Jesus. They're going to see His cross. They're going to see His love. And then they're going to have to make a choice. Do we want Jesus or do we want the beast? Do we want the Bible or do we want the traditions of men? And God wants us to preach this message with a loud voice in these final hours of human history. I believe this with all my heart and I'm thrilled that I have a chance to be here tonight and to share these simple, basic, powerful truths with you. Now, I also want to show you another quote. I've got a little bit of time left here. Take a look at this. In the Great Controversy, page 608, it tells us that as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth 
they will abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Now, I hope that doesn't happen to anybody here. But that statement says that when the crisis hits, there's going to be a, a group, a large class, who are not, they're not grounded in the Bible. They're not grounded in the scriptures. They're not grounded in Jesus. They're not grounded in his grace. They're not grounded in his love and in his power and in his word. And when the crisis hits, they're going out. But there's going to be a whole other group of people that are on the outside that are coming in. And those that stay in and have the Holy Spirit give the message to those who are out there and those who are outside come in. Some who are in go out. Many who are out come in. And those who come in and those who stay in together, they go through. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I've, I'm determined that I'm going to stay in. Stay in the truth. Stay in the scriptures. Stay in Jesus. And hold on by faith. By faith. Uh, this is very, very powerful information. And God wants us to be among those who stand, not those, not among those who get blown away when the pressure's on and the crisis hits and the world is coming together and saying, we've got to heal the planet. We've got to help the calamities go away. We've got to come together as families. We need to keep Sunday holy and come back to God. And it's going to look so good but there's a major flaw in the ointment, and the flaw is it's not according to the Ten Commandments. And it's been predicted in Bible prophecy. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandment. The ultimate issue is not legalism. It's not a legalism issue. It's a love issue. Do we love our Creator? for what he did for us? Do we love Jesus who gave his life for us? Are we willing to love him and stand up for him and keep his commandments no matter what happens in this world? That will be our test. And if we, if we can't stand now, how are we going to stand then? We need to be standing up right now. And those that love him and keep his commandments, they will be ready for verse 14, Revelation 14, Verse 14, right after verse 12, where there's a group of commandment keepers who have faith in Jesus, who follow Jesus because of his grace and love. Verse 14 says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Jesus is coming in verse 14, and he's coming to get the people who are described in verse 12. And we can all be part of that people. No matter how many sins we've committed, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how far away from God we have fallen, Jesus is able to lift us up. Jesus is able to forgive our sins. Jesus is able to change our lives. Jesus is able to help us put us back together and bring us through. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, years ago, I was a, I sometimes say, I was a disco dancing, pot smoking, cocaine snorting Jewish lost soul but Jesus changed my life he changed my life and what he did for me he can do for you uh, I'll tell you the final my final story almost 11 years ago to the day I was standing on this platform and I was giving a message on the uh, tribulation in the book of Revelation and the television monitors in front of me started flashing, labor now, labor now, labor now. They changed the title of that sermon from uh, seven years of tribulation to labor now. <laughs> and I got out of here. I drove to Templeton uh, Hospital where my wife was uh, having unexpected complications. Seth wasn't due for another three weeks. But because of certain issues, the doctor said, we're taking him out. So the next night, July 22nd, 2000 for almost 11 years to the day. I was there in the operating room and I heard the doctor say, one, two, three, push. And the next thing I knew, this little kid came flying out of my wife like a missile. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was bloody and he was screaming and howling and yelling and 
And uh, I looked at this little kid screaming and howling and yelling, and then they took, they took little Seth and put him next to me on a little table. And I looked down at this naked, bloody baby, <laughs> and I said to him, I said, Seth, Seth, it's your daddy. It's your daddy. And the most amazing thing happened. At that moment, little Seth stopped crying. Immediately. He put his two fingers on his mouth, and he went like this. <laughs> he was looking for daddy. And I tell you, that moment, it changed my life. I fell in love with that little kid, and I love him to this day. He, right now, I think he's in the junior tent. <laughs> He'll be 11 in two days. And, and I thought about that afterwards. I thought, why did Seth stop crying? Why did he stop crying? And I'll tell you why. Because he knew Daddy's voice. He knew my voice. And so I, I plead with you. As you have heard this message, you've heard the Bible, you've heard the prophecy, you've heard the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear your father's voice? He's talking to you. He loves you. Brothers and sisters, we're almost home. Hallelujah. Jesus is getting ready to come. Prophecy is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Listen to that voice. He's talking to your heart. He loves you. He wants you. He wants you. He wants me. He wants my kids. He wants my wife. He wants Seth. He wants Abby. He wants my parents. He wants you. Jesus is getting a people ready for heaven. Let's listen to his voice. Let's give him our hearts. Give him our lives. Let's decide to follow the Bible and to get ready not only for the mark of the beast, but to get ready for heaven. It's coming soon. May God help us to arise and shine because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Words from this holy book A promise caught my attention a promise from Jesus, it's all about Jesus Christ. Revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, Blessed are those who read these words and hears the truth this prophecy blessed are those who keep these words for the time is at hand the time is at hand it's all about jesus christ revelation of jesus christ
nation of Jesus Christ. He said, blessed are those who read these words and hears the truth in this prophecy. Blessed are those who keep these words for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus.